So one of the things that came out of that event, especially the February 6th convening on the future of music in LA, I feel so short, hold on. <laughs> Um, was that we had two big questions that kind of came out of some of it. One was, if other cities were having challenges in keeping venues open, then why were we having other things happening? What was making Los Angeles different? And the other one is that we don't tend to map or track Los Angeles. And so one of the great conversations that came out of that uh, was from the NOW Institute talking about a mapping that they were in the midst of. And so uh, please help me welcome um, Philippe Maman, and I'm probably mispronouncing Philippe's name. Am I? No, that was okay. Uh, from the NOW Institute, I will pull up his slides to share visions of Los Angeles and what does Los Angeles look like when kind of has, has uh, teed this up that we have such a diverse and spread out Los Angeles. And why are we this interesting mix of legal and non-legal and interesting venue? So let's bring Philippe up to the table. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Gigi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Philippe Maman, and I work for the NOW Institute. Um, we're an urban design research organization based here at the architecture department at UCLA. Um, and today I'm filling in for our, our director, Yi Sang Yi, who unfortunately could not be here. Um, but uh, I am. So um, our current focus is on musical education in Haiti, and at a larger level, the focus is actually on how cultural heritage is connected to the urban development needs of Port-au-Prince and Cap Haitian. Um, and what you're looking at here is uh, the current design for a campus master plan outside of the uh, center of the city in Cap Haitian. Um, and this, this campus is actually going to be the largest performance space in the city. It's going to seat over 2,000 people, and by 2020, we will have this band shell here um, constructed. And um, what that's gonna be is a place for um, not only the 450 students that the campus will house to come and connect music to their own education and to um, the needs of agriculture in the city and, and urban development, but also um, a place that, that showcases um, how structures like this can be earthquake and hurricane resistant um, and, and allow the culture of Haiti to persevere um, throughout the natural disasters that we know are gonna be coming down the line. Um, another one of our ongoing projects is um, the UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge. And uh, this is a publication that we've been uh, working on with professors Mark Gold and Richard Wirtz here at UCLA. And um, the goal of this publication is actually to start more interdisciplinary conversation around the uh, issues that face LA County as we approach 2050 and our population increases to 11.5 million people. And, um, and we need to transition to things like 100% renewable energy usage and local water usage and enhanced ecosystem health. And the reason I'm mentioning this now is not only because it's on the printing presses at the moment, but, uh, but also because we're trying to connect these issues to issues of cultural diversity here in Los Angeles. And this has actually been one of our significant platforms in the research that we're performing to date. Um, right now, what we're looking for are indicators of, of public spaces that are conducive to uh, preservation of cultural heritage and of, of new cultural expression. And what we've come across and uh, what seems to dovetail with, uh, with your goals here at the Herb Alfred School um, are, are musical venues and their trajectory in LA and their, um, their confluence with urban development in Los Angeles. Um, we know that music venues draw people to new areas of the city. They draw people from other cities into our city. Um, and they, they encourage things like business development in underserved areas and, and transit development, things that we know are necessary um, to, uh, to help uh, build equity in our city. Um, and again, we know that, that culture is inherently connected to those things as well. Um, and what we're actually interested in is what takes, um, what takes a public space um, from being conducive to informal expression and temporary expression, things like busking, to, uh, to a more formal center? Um, is it availability of shelter? Is it the actual um, spatial characteristics of that place? Is it the confluence of streets? Is it uh, access to a transit hub, to pedestrian traffic, to auto traffic? Um, and and we're, we're trying to, uh, to, to categorize all those things and understand where the commonalities lie so we can then identify the types of public space where we should be looking to identify the, um, the new format of, of musical performance here in the city and the connections to, to urban development needs for the future. Um, so this is, is one of our, uh, it's a little bit older, it's a couple years old now, um, is a project on the corner of Broadway and 94th. Um, and this was a project done, a community development project done with the Community Health Councils, which is a community development corporation based in South LA. Um, and the idea here was to connect needs for, um, for uh, equitable access to healthy food in a neighborhood, um, things like professional education, permanent supportive housing, and productive cultural space to, um, to uh, a 
an intersection that we knew was conducive to a new transit hub. So we're, we're always looking for these uh, different types of cultural support systems that be, can be connected to, uh, to urban development futures. And those are the features that we're trying to identify. Um, and it's, uh, it's not just the underserved areas of the city that we know need attention. It's also things like places like per Pershing Square. Um, and in a plan that we, uh, we submitted for its renewal, um, we, we were looking at how green space in the city can be connected to, to um, cultural performance and to new forms of, uh, of transit nodes. Um, now, as we uh, started to, um, to identify those, uh, those venue indicators that I was referencing earlier, we were, we're seeing patterns in, 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 um, in the historical development of LA. Um, and the first and clearest that we saw was this concentration towards downtown and um, the linear um, sort of spine moving out to the, to the, to the coast. Um, now, we broke this analysis apart in 2009 because that's actually when we started to see a decline in these larger scale formal venues popping up. And the ones that we were seeing, we, we were noticing pop up, were following largely the same spatial patterns that we saw before. So we realized we need to make a change in our, in our research direction. And we moved into looking at festivals. Um, and the benefit of, of festivals, at least for us, is that these, um, they're less permanent. They, they are able to adopt different areas of the city at different points in time. Um, and it gives us a really good indicator of the types of space in our city that are conducive to supporting different cultures around the city. Um, and when you look at all these things together, you start to see that, that east-west spine pattern diffuse and move more south, move into other parts of the, of the county and the city itself. And um, what we're frustrated with is that we can see this, this east-west axis. We can see the, the, um, the more developed axis already. What we can't see and what we know exists is this north-south north axis moving from downtown down to Long Beach. Um, we know there's community development happening there. We know there are emergency services allocated there. We know there are plans for transit extension into that area of the city. We don't know why we can't see the same uh, cultural venue growth or musical venue growth happening there. Um, so what we're trying to do is understand what the commonalities are from that north-south spine to the east-west and how we can identify areas where we should be looking for new forms of musical expression in the city and their connection to urban development needs. Um, the way we've been doing this um, over the past few months is to identify different linear spines in the city um, and, and uh, the, the differences in land use across those spines. And what we've noticed, especially with Wilshire uh, Boulevard, which is what you're seeing here, um, is that there are zones of specificity and those zones generally follow areas of higher density. So when, when you look at downtown, when you look at Santa Monica, when you look at Century City, each of those have very specific uh, groupings. You can see the residential orange in, uh, in Santa Monica. You can, see, you can see the retail space in downtown. And what we're interested in is what enables those different nodes to remain um, not industry specific, but specialized um, and, and what allows them to communicate with one another. And the obvious answer, and as what we've uncovered, is, is their connection to this established transit spine. So, um, so what we're doing is, is uh, looking at the types of data that we're, uh, that we're surfacing in that type of um, analysis and trying to, to qualify it at a larger level. Um, and these, these tiers are, are what is, is generally accepted as, as the types of data that, that allow us to analyze these cultural issues. And uh, nationally, and with uh, the majority of other urban institutes out there, um, it's the quantitative, nationally comparable, and publicly available information that's of greatest interest. And what we're actually more interested in is the data that's restricted, the data that we know is there but we can't see, and the data that's more qualitative and just driven by clearancing, uh, clearancing the plates. Um, and as we look for, for that type of data um, throughout our city, uh, we've started to look at different industry sectors and use them as almost metaphors for, for how we look for new areas of musical expression and cultural expression in our city. When we look at park space, we've been looking at the different, uh, and we again, we know that um, that LA City and I believe the county has plans to um, to encourage uh, all residents to to be within a half a mile of a park. It's not that they're going to physically move people; it's just that more parks are popping up, um, and we're interested in, in where those parks are popping up, how they're popping up, then the relationship between smaller parks to, to larger parks, pocket parks to Elysian, um, and uh, and I, we're trying to identify that same north south axis in, in this mapping to try to get a better sense of where we should be looking for cultural venues around the city. Um, we're also looking at, at healthcare in the same way. So we're looking at, um, at which neighborhoods have uh, major institutions already there, and then where there are more informal new models like urgent care popping up around them. Um, what is it about a neighborhood that's conducive to an urgent care unit popping up without the, uh, the, the magnet of a hospital already existing? What, what is it about a hospital that encourages um, other urgent care units to pop up around it? So we're trying to apply that again to venues like the Wilshire and the Hollywood Bowl that, um, that can encourage other informal uh, performance, and then we're trying to identify other areas of the city where that's happening. So again, you can start to see that that north-south axis popping up, and it's frustrating that we can see it in every other sector besides music. But that's what we're trying to. Um, 
Um, when we look at education, a similar thing, what, what you're seeing here, um, I should say, are the public schools that have begun to adopt more interdisciplinary modes of education. They're the schools that are, are pushing their students out into the city and measuring STEM education against, against real life examples, against community gardens and, and public places. Um, and, and this is the type of public, uh, the type of neighborhood attitude, public space that we're, that we're looking for and we think would be representative of the, uh, of the venues we're trying to identify. Um, and again, what's encouraging here is you actually start to see that that east, west, north, south pattern patterning diffuse. It's it's less obvious here, and um, and that means that there's cultural progression going on all over the city that we don't know about and that we can identify um, if we can identify the commonalities in these patterns. Um, now, it's not only the uh, the formal institutions or the established institutions' uh, successes or open mindedness that we're looking for. It's also symptoms of of underserved areas. Um, and connected to the Broadway and 94th project that I described earlier, um, we're looking at, at food deserts in Los Angeles, which um, uh, can be defined as as areas of the city that don't have uh, universal access to healthy food for their residents. They, that just isn't there. It's where fast food predominates. It's where there's not enough green space or park space. It's where uh, you literally can't see green within multiple miles. And that's that that is um, that surrounds the site of our project at, at 94th. Um, in conjunction with the Grand Challenge uh, publication that I mentioned earlier, we're actually looking at how transit routes overlap with all this because that's that's what we ultimately want to identify is how can we encourage people um, to travel to new areas of the city and how can we encourage them to do so in a sustainable manner um, as our population grows. So what we're looking at at automotive routes and how they've changed over time. We're looking at um, the public transit routes like rail and we're looking at the city's plans for extensions there and how that coincides with the areas of the city where we know um, musical ex expression and cultural expression of any kind is happening. And we're trying to identify where that gap is um, and why there's a gap in general. Um, what we're trying to identify what the features of that the city are are, um, are using our versus our own. Um, and when you look at the, the bus map, um, that, that same sort of fall off pattern towards the southern half of the county that um, I don't know, you might have noticed in the educational map that I showed, that's, that's happening as well. And there, there are spines coming down to the south there as you, as you get towards Long Beach, but even those are not um, correlated with the areas we know where the most um, informal concerts um, and venues are popping up are. Um, and so what we're most interested in are these um, are urban life cycles of cultural venues. Um, it's, it's what what takes an area of the city that being conducive to someone playing their own music uh, on the street, like busking, to, to a, a public park that's de devoted space to public performance and cultural expression, to an, a cultural institution like LACMA that's already established um, that, that makes its space available to different types of public expression. And then finally, something like the Hollywood Bowl or the Wiltern that, that is a much more formal setting. And we're trying to identify, um, is there something about the spatial organization of the, the places that those, those institutions and those um, experiences exist that's conducive to developing a life cycle towards formalization? Is that a linear thing? Is it a cyclical thing? Um, is there even a benefit to formalization or do we want to let, um, let musical expression um, uh, just happen and disappear and encourage people to travel and keep exploring? Um, and we don't know and those are, those are the questions that we're trying to answer now with our research. Um, but that gives you a, and I apologize for speaking so quickly, but uh, that gives us a, a pretty good overview of, of how we're integrating musical culture into our, into our work. Okay. Thank you, Alan, the beautiful Box of Doom. Box of, <laughs> Box of Doom is open. Um, any questions from our live studio audience? I will gently toss you the box. Hi, I was uh, I was curious if schools were also a part of this kind of research, where where schools and communities, because I would think families and education is a big piece of also this, and how it supports um, theaters or or venues or performance. That is exactly that's another feature that I to mention actually about the educational side of this research. We are we are looking at how communities um, push each other to to expand into new types of. States. And um, the reason behind all these publications that we put out, um, like the Grand Challenge, is to spur that type of interdisciplinary understanding. It's not just around cultural venues. So if we don't understand how, how schools, how public space are approaching the same issues, we won't be able to identify those areas of the city where data is missing. I would, I would think that the, that the relationship between the two also actually strengthen, uh, because if, if young kids are around that kind of music, then you're going to be driving sort of the future musician. You know, and that's our goal in Haiti as well, as we know that the youngest generation there is the largest generation. So we need to, we need to instill this sense of pride in the cultural heritage mm -hmm. of the place and, and attach that to solutions for present day issues. And it's, it's not different here in LA. It's different problems maybe, but it's the same logic. And, mm -hmm. and I apologize if you can share 
So uh, Nadine Levitt uh, and I have a music technology company called Whirly Edu. And I'm also on the board of the Broad, uh, it's, uh, the, the education at the Broad State. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I couldn't help but notice that on the map that um, our venue wasn't included <laughs> because oh, no. it didn't actually reach down to San Pedro, which is part of the city of LA. And uh, Grand Vision Foundation is a cultural space, a performance venue, and an arts education organization. So that might be, and there are a couple other spaces in um, San Pedro as well. So it might be nice to include that area of LA. It would, it would. In the research. I, I should have, uh, I was trying to avoid mentioning actually earlier that we are early in this research and, and we haven't completed the map. And you can see it also doesn't extend up until the, into the north part of the valley yeah. or up along the coast. So we are still populating these maps and trying to uh, create the patterns that we can then analyze. It's, it's amazing research. It's wonderful. And um, because of my work in uh, arts education in LA, I also know that many cultural spaces are involved with arts education. And, um, and have arts education arms, and those are some of the most vital um, cultural spaces in the city. So, it, and that has been mapped as well by LA County mm -hmm. yes, quite extensively. So, that might be another way to uh, research those cultural spaces and what's happening in community by looking at those pretty well mapped um, arts education uh, efforts of of performing arts organizations and cultural spaces. And that, that is something that we're looking at as well, but, yeah. but our, our attitude is more trying to reverse engineer from different types of, or other sectors to try to identify new public spaces and things that might've been missed already in those maps. Yeah, it's wonderful work. So thank you for sharing. Hi, my name is Connie Corley and I'm uh, from Field and Graduate University, Professor Emeritus from Cal State LA and produce and host a show on KPFK FM. And um, there are a few things, just very quickly, I realize you're looking at the city, but obviously San Gabriel Valley and some of these adjacent areas, Pasadena, which used to have a festival every summer, and the Levitt Pavilion, that seems to have disappeared, things like that. But I'm interested in also the sense of neighborhoods. So if you look at areas like Boyle Heights, which has this rich cultural history and so, you know uh, is in transition, I'm wondering if you're gonna take any kind of like a neighborhood focus. Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to identify is not just um, uh, public intersections and, and plazas, but also neighborhoods as a whole that don't just need help, but need to need to change formalized um, systems that have been in place for, for decades. Right? And Boyle Heights is, is just like that. There have been different dominant cultures in that area over time, and, and it seems to adapt and, and adjust of its own accord. Uh, <laughs> and, and we're looking at those types of places as well. We are. We're going to move to the next speaker as I talk to the box. Um, Philippe, <laughs> how would people get a hold of you guys to be able to, oh, everyone's bios and organizations are linked from musicinla.org as well as from the event pages. So if you are thinking, wow, this is a wonderful young man, I'd like to have him come speak at my organization, that's good, but how would, how would they find you guys? Um, you guys could find us at thenowinstitute.org or you can walk right across the street to the Architecture and Urban Design Department, and then we'll be there in room 1117. Excellent. Yeah. Round of applause, please, for Philippe.